Okay, deriving the trigonometric identities for adding uh, of adding angles because I was doing some work with um, with some uh, robotic stuff and this comes up in simplifying some of the equations for um, uh, chaining together um, rotations and I'll show you why in a minute. So the sum of two angles. Well, first of all, let's let's back up a bit and um, remind ourselves of a wee bit of trigonometry, um, just in case anybody um, is forgetting. So in a triangle where you've got a right angle here and you've got a radius r, call the, I'm going to call it r, this is the length of hypotenuse, then the length of this side is r sine theta, and the length of this side is r cos theta. Opposite over hypotenuse for sine, adjacent over hypotenuse for cosine. Now, we're going to take that little tidbit of information, and we are going to figure out what happens when you try and add two angles together, say alpha and beta. So this whole thing here is alpha plus beta. Actually talk about the sine and the uh, cosine of alpha plus beta in terms of simply the sine of alpha and the sine of beta alone. And you'll see why in a minute. And it, it actually is is quite nice and it's a combination of a linear algebra and um, and geometry, and I just love when mathematics does that kind of thing for you. But anyways, um, let's just start with this simple case, more or less, of these two angles and then the sum of these two angles. Now, what we're trying to get to is what is the sine of alpha plus beta and what is the cos of alpha plus beta? And again, you'll see why these come up in a bit. I can never remember these identities because they're they're a bit complicated, but what I can remember is this construction. If you drop a perpendicular from this line down to this line, and then you drop a perpendicular from that point down to here, and if you draw a parallel across here, you get some other triangles. So, since this is parallel to this, and this is a perpendicular, that's a perpendicular. So you've got this triangle here, and let's pick this point such that this distance is 1. And you'll see why in a minute. So now, remembering that r sine theta and r cos theta thing, if r is 1, that makes this distance here simply sine of beta, and it makes this distance here simply cos of beta. So now we've got this length and this length. Now, what is this whole length here? Well, it's the same length as this. Well, let me just drop a temporary perpendicular here because we'll need it in a sec. So this whole distance is, um, well, since this is a triangle of length 1 and this angle is alpha plus beta, this is actually sine of alpha plus beta. Right there. And over here, once again, triangle with a hypotenuse, length 1. This is alpha plus beta, so this is simply cos of alpha plus beta. Not too bad so far. What that means if is if we can figure out this length and this length and this length, we're in business. <clears throat> and if those turn out to be um, uh, in terms of sine alpha and sine, or sine of cos or of alpha and beta, uh, we'll be in business. All right, so let's take this big triangle down here. Since this is alpha, and this radius is cos beta, what does that make this distance? 
R is cos of beta. And then this would be sine of alpha. Because this angle's alpha, we're in this triangle here. Um, so that means R, which is cos beta, sine of alpha. And it also means that this whole distance here This whole distance is r, which is cos of beta, times cos of alpha. Because remember, this triangle, so it's r cos alpha. Gets us these two lengths. So you've got this whole thing in terms of cos base and cos alpha. Now, if we can figure out this length, And this length, we're in business. Well, in this triangle, we've got a right triangle. Let's, let me just draw this horizontal line in here. So now we have two parallel lines that are intersected with a line. So that means that the corresponding angles are equal. And when you have two intersecting lines, the um, opposite angles... Are equal. So that's just simply if you've got two lines, those two angles are equal. So that's alpha. So this angle here is 90 minus alpha. This angle here is 90 minus alpha because this is a 90 degree angle right here. And if you do all of your arithmetic knowing that a line adds up to 180 degrees, this is 90 minus alpha, this is 90 minus alpha, so we've got 180 minus 2 alpha, but that includes this, so we subtract that out, and so we've got alpha left here. It's just some algebra or just some arithmetic. So now we've got an, a triangle, small triangle up here where you've got sine of beta is the hypotenuse. So now that means we can just write out our, <clears throat> our other sides. So the opposite, remember, for angle alpha is sine of beta times sine of alpha. And this side here is sine of beta cos of alpha. So what does that mean? That means sine of alpha plus beta that's equal to sine of beta cos alpha. Actually, let me write those in the other order. Um, sine of alpha cos beta Plus, so sine of alpha cos beta, and then I'll put the alpha and the beta in the same order as well. Cos of beta, a uh, cos of alpha sine beta. Cos of alpha sine of beta. So that the alpha and beta always come in the same order. So sine cos cos sine. That gets us one of our identities doesn't actually really matter what order these come in, and people put them in different orders in order to help them remember them, but who cares, right? If you can just draw this little diagram, it, um, it lets you figure things out. Now, let's take a this, look at this cos of alpha plus beta guy right here. Cos of alpha plus beta. What's that equal to? Well, that's equal to... Um, that's this part here, cos of alpha plus beta, remember. That's equal to cos alpha cos beta minus this part here, but since these are parallel, it's this one, so sine alpha, so it's this length here, 
which is sine alpha times sine beta. Nothing too mysterious at all. So that's when you add two angles together. Now, what happens when um, you have a, a difference of two angles? Okay. That, mean, that means we need to um, remind ourselves of another little fact. I'll put it up here. So the sine function looks something like this. And it's anti-symmetric around the vertical y-axis. And by anti-symmetric, what I mean is, if you have an angle alpha here, negative alpha over here, the sine of those is opposite and equal to the sine of alpha. So what that's really saying is that sine of negative alpha equals negative sine of alpha. So that's the sine. And then for the cosine, cosine is actually symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And what that means is if you have negative alpha over here, alpha over here, they have the same value. So cos of negative alpha is equal to cos of alpha. Just remembering what those things look like. If you're good with faces, you should be able to be good with this. All right, so these little facts, this sketch gets us to here. And now, what if we had the difference of two angles? So what if we wanted to figure out what sine of alpha minus beta is. Well, it's not too bad. Sine of alpha is, we know that this identity holds, and this is the same thing of sine of alpha plus negative beta. You can rewrite this as alpha plus negative beta, just to be pedantic. Right? So this is sine of alpha cos of negative beta plus cos of alpha sine of negative beta. And then using our formulas up here, if there's a, a negative, cos of alpha is equal to cos of negative alpha. So cos of negative beta is equal to cos of beta. So this is sine alpha cos beta. And now, what's going on here? Sine of negative alpha is negative sine alpha. So sine of negative beta is negative sine beta. So this is the same thing as negative cos alpha sine beta. So notice, that term equals that, and this is the negative of that. So what we do um, as a shorthand is we say sine of alpha plus or minus beta is equal to, in the case where it's plus, it's plus, and when the case when it's minus, it's minus. So plus or minus cos alpha sine beta. So alpha minus beta, that's the way you just read this as a shorthand. So now, using the same argument as before, what is cos alpha plus minus beta. Well, cos alpha, cos of negative beta, so that's not going to change. That's just because cos is cos. Uh, cos of negative is cos of the positive, so that's cos alpha, cos beta. But what's happening over here? Here we have a negative when it's um, when it's when we're adding them, but what happens when beta is negative? 
we've got a sine of negative beta, which is negative sine beta, so the negative times negative makes it a positive. Minus plus sine alpha sine beta. This is a little tricky. You have, if you're going to try and memorize these things, you have to remember that the signs swap. But that is a lot of lot to remember. And I, uh, you know, as an exercise to warm yourself up, this isn't a bad little exercise if you're going to be doing things with trig. Okay. So, the simplest robot that one can imagine, I think, is just a simple arm at the end of a pivot. So this would be your effector, and this would be your axis of rotation. And so it rotates around, well, let's, let's give ourselves a coordinate frame so that we have something that we're talking specifically about. And so it rotates around this point. Now, there are much more complicated machines, but every, you know any rotational joint is going to have this kind of analysis that we have to do. In particular, what position will it have if it rotates another little bit? So if this initial condition is it's at angle alpha, and then I add another bit of rotation, beta, what point is the resulting effector going to be located at. And there are tons of machines that are just this simple. I mean, um, Simone made a uh, minor industry out of just simple machines like this. For instance, and then you've also got a pair of underwear that you found in your husband's car that broke yours. <laughs> and then... Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so no, no matter what you have as an effector on the end of it, you're just rotating an arm by a certain number of degrees, beta, okay? So we want to be able to calculate what position our, our point is going to be at if we rotate it through a certain number of degrees. And the reason why you do that is because you want to control how fast it might be going or, you know, increase its speed if it's got a long way to go and decrease its speed when it's getting closer. So you've got some sort of proportional. Anyways, so how can you do that? Well, the most, um, the most basic way would just be to decompose these two points. So let's call that P0, our initial point. This is going to be called P1. Now... You can think of those points in space um, in the xy plane. So it's got some x coordinate. So this is going to be, well, if this length is r. So p0, first of all, we're going to say that that's equal to some point x0, y0, uh, x0, y0. And p1 is equal to x1, y1. So that's just writing those as co uh, coordinate pairs in the plane. But we know what x0, y0 are and x1, y1 are because we know what alpha and this angle here. So in this instance, these two, so P0 is equal to not just x0, y0, we know what x0, y0 are. So x0 is equal to r cos alpha. And y0 is equal to r sine alpha. Simple, just like that. And similarly, we can see if this is alpha plus beta, this whole angle, alpha plus beta, P1 is equal to r cos alpha plus beta and r sine alpha plus beta. Okay, we knew its initial condition was alpha, and we knew it was rotating by an angle beta. So if we could find out what cos alpha plus beta is in terms of cos alpha and cos beta, we've got our problem solved, right? So that's why you, um, you get those trigonometric identities out, because some, 
you, you need them in order. To, well, I, I'm, I'm going to retract that. You don't exactly. This is where those identities get motivated. Why do we need them in order to simplify equations like this? But actually, if you think about rotations in a different way, rather than just adding up sines and cosines, x and y components, what you um, what you end up finding is easier ways of seeing why those trigonometric identities are true. And one of the ways of thinking about how to compute rotations is if you know a little bit of linear algebra and you know, then you might have run across matrices of the form A negative B, B A. Matrices that look like this are actually complex numbers. And if you have matrices that are of a very, very special form, in particular, A is equal to cos beta, and B is equal to sine of beta, and that means sine beta here, cos beta here. Matrices that are in particular of this form are actually rotation matrices by an angle beta. It's crazy, but it's true. So, if you have an initial point, x naught, y naught, that's going to, if you multiply these two things together, you're going to get a new vector, um, x1, y1, and x1, y1, well, you do the matrix multiplication, so that's going to be x0 cos beta minus y0 sine beta. So that's our x1. And what's our y1? Rho times column. And so that's x0 sine beta, y0 cos beta. Right? But, but don't forget that we know what x0 and y0 are. x0, sorry, not x1, x0 is equal to r cos alpha. And y0 is equal to r sine alpha, right? Uh, that's our initial point, r cos alpha, r sine alpha. So our initial point, x naught, y naught. So now we just substitute in x naught and y naught, and we get that x1 is equal to r cos alpha cos beta. So this is our x naught part. X naught is R cos alpha, so that's X naught. And then cos beta is that part. Minus, now, what's Y naught? It's R sine alpha. Sine beta. And now, what's this part? So this is X naught is equal to R cos alpha, so that's R cos alpha. Sine beta. And then this is equal to what's our why not? It's our sine alpha uh, cos beta. So we've got r cos alpha cos beta minus r sine alpha sine beta. And this is our x component, which is cos alpha plus beta times r, so we can factor r out of here. So we've got x1 is equal to factor r out, and that's cos alpha cos beta minus sine alpha sine beta. So we can see that our x component, cos alpha plus beta, So this cos alpha plus beta has to be equal to cos alpha cos beta minus sine alpha sine beta, <laughs> just like the trigonometric identity.
So we've got that simplification that we can make, or we can say that that's how that trigonometric identity arises. Crazy, isn't it? But that's not all. There is a third way of thinking about um, rotations in the plane, and this is the most beautiful of all, I swear. Okay, so it's totally worth its own page. And it's e to the i, um, okay, let's call it beta, is equal to cos beta plus i sine beta. <laughs> yeah, and it, remarkable, absolutely remarkable that you can write rotations this way. But you certainly can. Um, and the reason why that works is oh man, there's a number of different ways of proving it. Probably the simplest way of proving it is by um, writing out the Taylor expansions of cos beta and sine beta and E in the complex plane. And so to prove that you need probably, well, depending on where you live, like I, man, in Hong Kong, it's probably like grade 10 or grade 11 where they learn this. But the first time I ran across it in, um, in North America, in Canada was in, um, I think first year, first year calculus. And that was in university. And it, you know, that wasn't even the calculus class the engineers were getting given. It, it was, I, I had to get into a, in, into a math major calculus class before I was introduced to this proof. But anyways, um, uh, it, it basically boils down to the fact that any function can, the, the, this, well, I didn't learn this for many years, but the functions can be approximated by polynomials. Polynomials form a basis for all continuous functions. And it can be shown that cos, beta, and sine, uh, cos and sine and the exponential are all continuous functions, um, infinitely differentiable. So you end up being able to, um, arbitrarily approximate the, um, these functions using simply polynomials. An infinite sum of polynomials, but only polynomials. So you've got some closed form wave. And then once you've got these polynomials, you can come up with clever algebraic tricks to turn them into infinite sums of small terms. And then you can recognize that th these two equations are equal in terms of those sums of terms. Again, quite a lot to, to prove, but anyways, um, Let's just suffice it to say that if you've got a, um, an angle beta, and if you interpret this point as a point on the unit circle in the complex plane, you've got the real, real, sorry, reals here. Um, you can also write this as e to the i beta is equal to cos beta plus i sine beta. So remember, we've got this, da, ba, da, so um, that's uh, sine beta, and that's cos beta, this point here. It can also be written as this. So now we've got this exponential. And remember, we've got this um, complex multiplication. So multiplication on this side, it's going to be multiplication on this side. But then it turns into addition up here, because that's the way exponentials work. So if you've got a point, let's say, over here. This is some angle alpha, sorry, you've got some point over here. And so this has got some coordinates X naught, Y naught. And those coordinates are also equal to, if you want to write it in the complex plane, it's going to be um, R cos alpha, and then plus I, R sine, okay, let's pull that out, R sine alpha, because it, R is going to be multiplying both of these terms. We can factor the R out. So R cos alpha plus I sine alpha. So now if we multiply those two together, so E to the I beta, that's this thing, um, cos beta sine beta, E to the I beta times, well, what's this thing? Well, that's just R times cos alpha plus I sine alpha, right? 
Um, so that's times R E to the I alpha. Cos alpha instead of cos beta. Sorry. So that's just R times cos alpha plus I sine alpha. R times E to the I alpha, which is the same thing as cos alpha plus I sine alpha. Right? So that's equal to R E to the I beta plus alpha. <laughs> I mean, it's so, it's so simple. It's so simple. You're just alpha plus beta, beta plus alpha. And then out of that falls out your trigonometric identities because you just resubstitute back in your sine and cos alpha and beta and out they fall. It's, it's beautiful, actually. Beautiful. Well, okay. Mathematicians have an odd sense of beauty. Let's just put it that way. So yeah, let's do it. E to the I beta, cos beta plus I sine beta. So R is going to come out in the front anyways. So cos beta plus I sine beta. Times uh, e, e to the I alpha, cos alpha plus I sine alpha. And I'm sure you can see where this is going because, you know, you, you multiply the first terms... And then you subtract the product of these two terms because I squared is negative one, sine alpha, sine beta. And then over here, we've got, um, uh, I've taken natural log of both sides, just in case anybody was wondering how the hell all of this dropped down into and E disappeared. Um, but that's what I did. Uh, so what do we have here? We have um, I uh, sine beta plus alpha. Oh, sorry, cos beta plus alpha plus I sine beta plus alpha. So yeah, it's long, but there you go. And so canceling out the R's and then collecting terms gives you, you know, multiplying these out and then collecting terms gives you that trigonometric identity for the addition of um, two angles. Unexpected, I think, actually is the most, um, yeah, it boggles the mind that th this should fall out of this. And first of all, it boggles the mind that actually this should be true. Because what's the exponential got anything to do? The exponential arises naturally, first of all, out of um, compound interest. So if you um, compound continuously, then your um, you can write the well what what you call the constant that is the limit of a um, a, a compounded interest rate is e. So it's got nothing to do with angles. What it's got to do with, is with in the real world is comp is uh, compounding interest continuously that's its most natural um motivation in the uh in the physical world compound interest why should compound interest have anything to do with circles why but there is this mathematical connection and so what you what I take from that is that if you can capture a mathematical representation of some physical event or some event in the real world and abstract that, um, that mathematical representation, and then you can take a completely unrelated physical representation in the real world and abstract that representation. And if you can show those abstract representations are identical, you've created some kind of a mapping in the real world between two absolutely unrelated phenomena. It boggles the mind. But math is boring. So, whatever. 
Okay. So, anyways, I, I, I hope that um, explains why I was all uh, on this um, trigonometric identities for um, expanding cos of alpha plus beta in terms of sine alpha, uh, in terms of individual components of beta and alpha. But I, I don't know why math gets taught the way it gets taught. And it is a little painful to have to go through so many, well, yeah, painful is the wrong word. Maybe painful is the right word. It, it's, it, it strikes me as odd that I had to go through so much mathematics before I found out why actually I was doing the things that I was doing in grade nine and grade 10. I mean, really, can't we start with building robots so that we want to understand this? Just a thought. Anyways, <laughs> as always, thanks for watching and uh, see you all later. This notion of a vector is handy because it allows us to talk about if you, if you think of the magnitude of the vector as 